Well, good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dave Webb of Stillwell, Kansas. I'm an auctioneer and appraiser by profession and a former member of this great body. Uh, we are here today as part of the Kansas Oral History Project. We're interviewing legislators who served from the 60s through 2000. Filming us today is Dave Heineman, a former legislator and very active in this Kansas Oral History Project, and we thank him for our work, for his work on that. Today we have with us Phil Martin from Pittsburgh, Kansas. Phil has a great history of public service and has just done a wonderful job and has some great family history, which we're going to talk about first. So, Phil, glad you're here. Good to see you. And uh, we've known each other quite a while. Yes, we have. We <laughs> sure have. So, I, if, if I could, I'd like to start. You have shared with me in the past about an incredible, to me, it's an incredible family story about your family immigrating from, I think it was Italy, right. uh, to Kansas. Can you kind of go back and bring us up to date on, let's start there. My family uh, came from around Turin, Italy, and uh, my great-grandfather and great-grandmother uh, immigrated to uh, uh, the uh, Americas uh, around uh, 1885, and they had uh, eight kids. Eight. Eight kids that they took with them. And from Italy. From Italy, right, and uh, the reason that they left was uh, my grandfather, great grandfather's uh, early uh, sons were eligible for the draft over there, and he didn't want them in the draft. Uh, Italy was fighting all kinds of wars all mm -hmm. over the place, so he took his family and packed up and they uh, shipped over to uh, Ellis Island. Okay. And from Ellis Island, they took the train to Oswego, Kansas. Wow. <laughs> took them a week to get to Oswego, Kansas. And I bet with eight kids, that was a pleasant trip. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and they stayed in Oswego. They bought an 80-acre tract. They sent some money over to... Uh, an individual that was from Oswego, and he bought 80 acres for them. And they stayed there for about four years uh, and decided to move over to Weir Scammon area because it took a, a day to get over to Weir, a day to do business, and a day to get back. So they sold the 80 that was in Oswego and then bought ground uh, in my home place. Okay. Uh, uh, which is about 160 acres. Uh, they, had, they had another 80 that they bought later on, uh, so they had 240 acres. Uh, and they were basically raising oats for the mules okay. uh, in the mines. And, okay, uh, and, and the mining area down there. Right, okay. right. And uh, my great-grandfather uh, gave every one of his sons a farm. Wow. The girls didn't get anything, <laughs> but the boys got a farm. Wow. And uh, my grandfather uh, got the place that I've got right now, Wonderful. 160 acres. So that house that's on it is the original old that's farmhouse? That's right, yes. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned that they, they made their money raising oats and then sell it to the mules that were carrying stuff out of the mines. We think of mines today with conveyors and right. drag lines. They didn't have that then. No, did they? no, they it didn't was, have any of that. They had they, mule power, they, not yeah, horse power. That's right, that's right. That's interesting. You had mentioned they had sent some money over to somebody in Oswego. Yes. Did they know this person? Did they? Yes, they did. They knew him and uh, trusted him, and uh, uh, he did what he was supposed to do. You know, it's incredible, as we think of today's society, doing that, sending money from wherever to somebody you had heard of and hoped that when you got there you had a piece of property yeah that's that's truly incredible and I probably probably it wouldn't happen as easy today as it did then no so, no well you and so that was your great-grandfather then your grandfather and tell us about your grandfather and your my father. grandfather uh, uh, married uh, my grandmother in uh, 1906 and they had five children uh, there were uh, four boys and one girl. Three boys stayed on the farm. My dad got married and his sister got married. And uh, 
the three boys eventually passed away and, and my dad and I inherited an 80 acres that was just to the east of the house there and uh, the Simones which are my first cousins uh, inherited the 80 to the south and when Francis uh, died uh, one of the brothers he was the last brother uh, he left it to all of us and I bought everybody out for right. that 80 so uh, I've got the, the 160, 160 back that, together yeah that's right. awesome that's a great great story and I hope your family keeps it together that's that you just don't hear of that happening lots it's anymore. it's let me tell you it's difficult with the prices that are out <laughs> yeah. there today but I, I I'm gonna keep it that's great that's great the uh, your father uh, what was his work and father and mother I should say what were their work um, and their my, dad, uh, my dad my uh, dad uh, well did a little bit of farming but he got out of it and after the war he went to work for Joe Smith tobacco company and stayed there until Kansas went wet uh, and I think it was around 53 and uh, he took a salesman's job uh, and sold liquor uh, to the retail stores okay. in about a five county area there. And, and on liquor in that era, I assume there was a distributor somewhere that then... Right, that's exactly right. The distributor was in Independence. It was Burlingame Distributing Company. Okay, okay. And, uh, they were bought out uh, in 1960, I believe. Okay. Interesting. I think that process is still somewhat. Now there's a few distribution companies that control that. that oh, we have absolutely, today. It, it absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, I forget the uh, the guy who famous brands is who bought them out. Okay. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, sold on service. Mm -hmm. All the deals and everything else that was done before were cut out. <laughs> <laughs> you have cash on the barrel now. Right. So, well, that's awesome. So you were obviously born in the Pittsburgh area. Right. Uh, Pittsburgh schools. Uh, right. Education. I graduated from PHS in 1966. Uh, wow. And then I sent on to Pittsburgh University. Right. I, I've got a graduate degree in economics. Was there any thought of going anywhere else or Pittsburgh was it? Pittsburgh was it for that's, me. That's, that's good. So, and you've lived there your entire life? Except when I was in the service. Oh, tell us about that. Well, I, it was the Vietnam era. Uh, I uh, was in the Army Reserves and uh, I uh, did my basic training at Monterey, California. Okay. And I was out there for six months. Okay. Uh, and then came back home and spent the, about the next five years uh, in the reserve unit there. Did you ever have to go to Vietnam? No. Very fortunate. Well, that, uh, that's interesting. So kind of almost the reason your great grandparents left Italy, then you were in the Army Reserves. Right, right. Uh, right. Thank you for your service on that. After college, um, kind of tell us what you did before you started getting involved in elective office and... Well, from after college, uh, uh, I went to work uh, as a deputy county treasurer. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad knew an individual by the name of Bill, Bill Pinamani, and he was uh, the deputy county treasurer at, at the time, and he left to come to the city of Pittsburgh uh, as the inspector. My dad said, that's a bad deal for you. <laughs> he owned a liquor store, and you're going to make everybody mad, and they're not going <laughs> to uh, come to your store because uh -huh. you're going to tell them you can't build here or you can't do this <laughs> or you can't do that. And I went over and applied as, as deputy county treasurer, and, and uh, uh, Gene Masterson hired me for that position. Okay, so you, you applied for the deputy treasurer, and then after that, then you were elected treasurer. No, uh, Gene, unfortunately, uh, uh, was embezzling money. Uh-oh. And he got caught. <laughs> After that, uh, Governor Bob Docking uh, okay. appointed me as county treasurer. Okay. I never did run for county treasurer. Uh, uh, I wanted to do something else, and 
the legislature passed a bill that said that any county over 10,000 had to have a full-time county appraiser. So I moved from the county treasurer's office to the county appraiser's office. And I was the first county appraiser in Crawford County. Okay. Uh, and at that time, that was obviously pre-appraisal uh, that took place in 85, which we'll talk about later. But it, it was a little different scenario. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, you, you didn't revalue real estate. Real estate was set, and the only thing you were doing was picking up the additions and, and new buildings and stuff like that. Personal property was the major issue mm -hmm. that you had uh, back then. Uh, and, and inventories were taxed, uh, right. uh, farm machinery, oil and gas, yes. uh, you know, the whole personal property gamut. You know, I remember uh, as a small child, in, uh, or not a small child, but a younger child, um, in, in that time we had a township person who would come around and fill out the forms. And his name, in our area, his name was Wayne Hanson, and he showed up at everybody's house at dinner time. Wayne was a bachelor. And, and he had this long rendition. He'd go, how many chickens you had, and how many cattle, and it had, it, how much money you had in the bank. And uh, We did that uh, for the first uh, year or so, uh, but then it changed uh, yeah. after that point. Uh, and the appraiser uh, started picking everything up at that okay. point. Yeah, and I remember I'd, I'd, for some reason I'd saved all that stuff and donated it to our county assessor's office. They had it on display for a while, and I'm sure about it, anybody that would have ever gone in there wonders today, why would they care how many chickens you had? Right, right. So, but, uh, it was, well, people it was, used to hide stuff, you oh, know? Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was a game. Yeah, oh, you, it, when you knew that era, I mean, people would talk about taking their tractors over to the neighbors or moving the cattle or right, doing right. these things. So it, you're right, it was, it was a game. Well, then, from there, uh, I think, uh, after John Carlin was elected governor, he was Speaker of the House, and then elected governor, ran against Bob Bennett, and then appointed you to property valuation director. That's that correct? correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, coming from Crawford County to, to being the director of property valuation and some of that history. Well, it was a, a time when uh, the issues uh, that were out there uh, was the the severance tax was the the, the was big it. issue yes uh i uh i came into office there was about uh 60 65 people that uh, were under me and i had uh, personal property division uh real estate division and utilities and uh all three of those we worked uh each year mm -hmm. uh uh of course uh, there were the real estate uh, was still fixed right. because uh, the legislature hadn't addressed the uh, the reappraisal issue, right. uh, but it was coming. Uh, the, the like they said, the first two years uh, were primarily uh, severance tax, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we would appear before. Uh, committees uh, on taxation and uh, go over what the property tax was doing. And, and uh, when I was first county appraiser, oil was selling for $3 a barrel. <laughs> then it went Can't to- buy a gallon of gas for that. Yeah, <laughs> now it went to, then it went to $12. And those guys who had, had oil thought they were wealthy. <laughs> yes. And uh, I remember Frank Gaines, ran for Congress after, uh, yes. after uh, uh, oil went to $12, and he financed his own <laughs> campaign. Uh, it went up to about $40, uh, and it was difficult to set the price, because uh, that's as of January the 1st. Right. Uh, it was when you'd set it. And that first year, I think it went to about $25. I said it close to that. Right. The counties that had oil all of a sudden were filthy rich. Yes. I mean, they had uh, valuation uh, uh, increases that were significant. Right. And of course, I changed the guide around a little bit. I got sued. Uh, I think I had like 
four or five thousand people that sued me. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Joseph was chairman of the tax or er, board of tax appeals, and Charlie uh, combined all the cases. He he just put them all under one and. And my guess is most of those 5,000 were probably members of the Kansas Oil and Gas Association. Oh, absolutely, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, and I, in 1978, I think, is when I was elected that first year, and that's when we first met. I was as green as green gets, and, uh, and I'm sure after we met, you said, who's this guy that doesn't know anything? <laughs> but um, I think that's when we first met, and the severance tax was the hot issue of that, right. of that era. And I remember the discussion being, Man, if we have this, it'll take care of education for, for eternity. We will never have to come back right. and have another funding item for education. I think it's played out a little different than that. Absolutely. And education has been uh, the uh, uh, funding question almost every session since that point in time. Right. And there's been new legislation for that. Um, as property value, what you talked about setting the property for the utilities. Uh, utilities obviously includes electric, railroad, and some of those. Tell us how that process worked. Well, uh, the railroads were uh, the primary, it was a unit valuation uh, system, and you would value the property as a total unit uh, rather than segregating out uh, individual uh, railroad uh, cars and all the rest of it, the right. track and all that. It was combined as a unit. Uh, and it was primarily based upon income. The income was the, the right factor. Because there wasn't, a, at that point, a lot of sales uh, of utilities. Mm -hmm. uh, there still aren't, but there's some. Uh, the railroads uh, had a federal act called the 4R Act. And they all sued me uh, because they were at 30% and they said everybody else that was out there, the oil and gas, the real estate, and whatever else, uh, was around 12%. So they were seeking a reduction of 30% down to 12%. Okay. And we went to federal court, and uh, Judge Rogers, federal judge, uh, ruled in their favor. Uh, we had told the governor uh, we're going to lose this case. <laughs> before you ever went there. Yeah, before we ever went there. He said, go ahead and get back and, <laughs> and, 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 and take it to court. <laughs> and that was still Governor Carlin then? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we would meet with him maybe once a month and advise him as to what was happening uh, with the case. But in the end, uh, we lost and... Uh, uh, the railroads got a reduction. That began to trigger the reappraisal issue uh, in the state. In the state, yes. At that time, how many railroads? About how many railroads were there in the state? I think when I first came in in 1978, uh, there were about 35. When I left, I think there were about six or seven. And in that original era. If a shipper complained, then a railroad had to provide service. Is that correct? That's right. That's exactly right. The 4R Act changed the balance of uh, power from the shippers to the railroads. The, after the 4R Act, uh, they were able to abandon lines uh, at will. Uh, okay. I mean, the shipper might might have griped about it, but it didn't That's do any good. Do it didn't do any good, and there were hundreds of lines that were abandoned, right. I mean, just all over the place. Right. And that set up uh, uh, a company uh, that's in Pittsburgh now uh, called Watco. And right. they do, they're a short line. Correct. And they, they do the hauling to the industrial parks and, you know, around uh, these cities. Mm -hmm. uh, because the uh, majors, they didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, see, see you, small town America. That's right. That's right. Right. And, and of course, today, when you see trains, if they're, most of them are unit trains, and if they don't have 110 cars, um, or if a shipper can't handle 110 cars, they're out of luck. Right, so right. That's how Watco grew. Watco grew 
uh, from just a local to, well, they're almost worldwide now. Wow. Uh, uh, just because of that 4R Act. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, property valuation director, um, what made you decide to run for Senate? And uh, that would have been about 1980, is that correct? Uh, it or was 82? 1984. 84. Yeah. Uh, oh, I just had a desire to uh, uh, be in the Senate and uh, decided I was going to run. And uh, Ed Royce, who was my predecessor, he uh, turned down a, 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 a term. So. Mm -hmm. He didn't run, right. and it was an open seat. Right. I do remember that. Ed came in in 1980, uh, and then... He left in 84. Yeah, 84, and you opened that. In fact, today, as we sat here, we're just one desk away from where your seat was That's here right. in this chamber. That's right, yeah. And uh, the same For 12 desk. years, I sat right over there. Yes, and um, you had some, as all of us who have served in here, you've had some great seatmates. Tell us maybe about your most interesting seatmate. Well, Rip Gooch uh, was probably the most interesting individual. Uh, he uh, was a Tuskegee Airman, uh -huh. or at least that's what I believe he was. Uh, and uh, he told me about uh, the things that they went through. Wow. Uh, Rip was uh, a black American, and uh, in the 40s, uh, they weren't treated quite as, uh, yes. as good as... Uh, perhaps today. Right. Uh, in fact, they didn't think they could fly. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. I remember seeing the movie about that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so. But Rip uh, was mayor of Wichita at one time, and uh, he was a fairly liberal individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that has to be one of the great memories of this chamber for you getting to set with him and oh, uh, yeah. do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we moved into the legislative arena, and um, and we all love campaigns, or we wouldn't do this in the, to, in, to begin with. Um, so you came in 84, appraisal, reappraisal kind of started happening about 84, five-ish. Right. Uh, and then it became a constitutional amendment. You came in probably with more tax knowledge than anybody that's probably ever been in this chamber uh, from being a, a county appraiser and then PVD. Let's start there with how, how you think that uh, well, went down, uh, tell the, us. The, my first term, uh, like I told you uh, uh, before, uh, I wasn't on the tax committee. Uh, mm -hmm. I was on federal and state affairs uh, at, at 11 o'clock. And uh, uh, the reason I was on federal and state affairs was kind of a punishment for voting <laughs> incorrectly on, the, there. <laughs> <laughs> on the, the minority leader's race. Yes. And I really didn't care because uh, I just considered it an extra committee. Uh, I knew everything that was going on uh, on the property tax issue that the tax committee uh, uh, was working. Uh -huh. And they'd send bills out to the floor and I'd get up and object to the uh, bill uh, because of the shifts that were there and, and uh, the problems that they sent that bill back to committee uh, probably uh, at least four or five times. <laughs> I bet that made a happy committee chair. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so as, as that whole process transpired and, and appraisals, prob especially real estate, had probably gotten out of whack over the prior 30, 40 years, um, and then it became a constitutional amendment, um, wasn't there some litigation that kind of preceded that, that made the legislature um, go into the reappraisal issue? Well, there was litigation all the time. Uh, and we had a sales assessment ratio study. And it showed that, uh, uh, well, homes were about 6 to 8%. Uh, commercial property mm -hmm. was about 10%. And farms were about three percent. Okay, and uh, there wasn't any uh, argument that uh, uh, we needed reappraisal. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that that definitely uh, was something that uh, uh, had to occur. And 
I would say that uh, the biggest uh, problems uh, came after reappraisal with the classification amendment. Yes. That's, that's the uh, problem that uh, uh, caused all the shiftage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, I didn't, I didn't, I voted against it because <laughs> what I wanted was just a constitutional amendment with no numbers and let the legislature, legislature let the legislature the come up with the numbers every year. Well, the uh, chamber didn't want that and the utilities didn't want that and the governor had to compromise. Uh, uh, which I was uh, a compromiser at that point. I, uh -huh. I said this is going to be a bad deal, and it was a bad deal. I mean, there were shifts that were tremendous out there. Uh, little restaurants in my community went up 400, 500 percent wow. because they didn't. The only thing they had was real estate. Right. They didn't have an inventory. It's like uh, Walmart. Now, Walmart might have had a $5 million building, but they had $100 million worth of inventory. inventory. And right. all and same way with equipment dealers or feed dealers or seed dealers. All right. of those people who had inventory, the, the inventory tax went away with this, and it all shifted to real estate. And farm machinery went away, too. Yes, I remember that. You're exactly right. I remember that. And airplanes. <laughs> I remember that, yes. For business use only. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and we exempted, there was something else that was exempted in there, but those were some, some of the major ones. Right, uh, right. And, and uh, the fights that went on for that uh, took uh, over a, a year. Uh, and eventually it passed. Uh, and when it took effect, uh, John Carlin was gone. Mike Hayden was, became, the, governor was the governor. I went in and seen Mike, me and Larry Wilbert, and I said, Mike, you've got to get this thing changed because it's going to kill you. Oh, Phil, how's the kids? <laughs> and I said, they're doing okay, but <laughs> they're better than you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> Eventually, uh, reappraisal hit and the classification numbers and people went nuts. Uh, I remember I was on the, the committee uh, that they had. We had a special committee uh, and Dan Thiessen was uh, the chairman and uh, we had uh, 5,000 people that were walking around this capital here going, come out Mike come out Mike. You know, as you say that, I remember that, and it, I remember that on the news, and uh, you're right. That was that Yeah, was oh, it was, it was an unbelievable deal. I saw a couple of guys that I knew, and I said, what are you guys doing up here? Well, we had uh, car washes, and my taxes went up 500 <laughs> percent. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and they had no inventory, so it they, all went Well, right, estate. that's right, and they were at the 25 percent level. They right. were at commercial level. Right. So, uh, that really uh, created uh, a mess, and uh, Governor Hayden got beat, I think, primarily because of that. I would, I would concur with that, yes. And, and anybody that's been in Topeka at any point in time, there's been all kinds of different marches for everything here at the State House, but I think 5,000 people was about the largest one Oh yeah, of, of yeah. It was history. the largest crowd that I've ever seen up here, uh, and they were walking around the Capitol. Wow! I mean, yeah. and come out, Mike. Come out, Mike. Well, in that era, we had the driveway around the Capitol that right. you could walk around. Yeah, and um, didn't, of course, that's all changed today. Well, tell us some other things about um, uh, tax issues, and we'll get to some other issues in a minute. But t tax issues that might have come up after that that uh, you have well, knowledge the, of. Well, the primary tax issue uh, was uh, myself and Dick Rock. Uh, we uh, introduced a, a bill together uh, that would have uh, reduced the property taxes by about a billion dollars. And we were going to get that from income tax uh, from uh, the brokers uh, uh, primarily. Uh, Dick used to say, 
wealth doesn't go in and out of barns. It goes in and out of these uh, small areas where the broker uh, uh, service type people. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was that was probably a very wise statement. And and uh, well, it was the truth uh, uh, because uh, I mean millions of dollars go through those brokers. Right. And barns are filled with hay. Right. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> and maybe a few small tractors. Right. <laughs> but uh, better exempt now. Uh, we passed the Senate with that bill, uh, and I, I kid everybody that we probably created about 125 lobbyist positions <laughs> <laughs> that year uh, just to come in and lobby against that bill. Had one for every House member. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the House uh, defeated it, uh, and it never came back up again. Right. Who was president of the Senate at that time? Uh, I believe Bud Burke was. Okay. Yeah, and Bud was from the Olathe area right. uh, at, at that point in time. So. Well, I remember Gus Boginia voted for it. Uh-huh. Uh, and se several of the Overland Park people were uh, supporters of it because right. of the large amount of uh, reduction right. in uh, the property tax that we proposed. Right. Um, so let's kind of move from tax issues. Tell us about some other issues um, uh, that are memorable issues. I, obviously, you can't tell us about everyone, and, and there isn't time today to do that, but let's talk about a couple of other issues that, uh, that are memorable as your time here. Well, probably one of the most memorable one was abortion. <laughs> and, still here today. <laughs> yeah, it's still here today. But back then, uh, Kathleen Sebelius and, and uh, several of the uh, House members passed a bill and sent it over to the Senate. And uh, Frank Gaines didn't want to deal with it, so yeah. he pulled the enacting clause. Uh, <laughs> he made a motion, and I think went winner seconded it and uh they were a pair right <laughs> right and uh we uh voted uh uh to pull the enacting clause well frank went home that weekend and he came back <laughs> and he got his you know what root out <laughs> and uh he came to bill morris and bill uh and myself and oh three or four others uh, started to develop uh, uh, a restrictions right. bill, and uh, it took about two, uh, three weeks, and we eventually passed a, uh, a restrictions bill, sent it over to the House, and it was uh, uh, opposed by several members over there, but it passed, went to the governor, which was Joan Finney at the at time. At that time, yes. And Came in after Mike Hayden. Right, yes. right. And we went down and said, Joan, you've got to sign this. And, of course, you had the opposition that went down to her. And, <laughs> so Price said, don't sign this. Right, don't sign this. And, and that went on for about a week, and she eventually signed that bill. Right. And I was in the Senate. The other, the other bill that I remember uh, was a death penalty. Okay. And uh, I was on the Judiciary Committee. There were 13 of us uh, on the committee. And uh, uh, we had it uh, stopped, seven to six. Death penalty and, bill. Yeah, the okay. death penalty bill. And Mark Parkinson, who was a big, he was the, the big supporter of uh, the death penalty uh, at the time, uh, went to Dick Rock, who was also on the Judi Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee. and said, I'll let you write the bill if you'll change your support over to us. Well, Dick went ahead and wrote the bill out and said, if you change one comma or anything, I'm out. <laughs> they didn't, and, and it passed the Senate, it passed the House, or uh -huh. passed the committee, and then went to the Senate floor. And uh, uh, it passed the, uh, the Senate and went over to the House, and the House passed it. And then it went down to the governor. Mm -hmm. Well, several of us, I know, I remember me and Dick Bond and one other person uh, from Wichita went down and begged her to veto it. She said, Phil, 
I'm just mad at you guys. <laughs> You're just playing games. <laughs> and, and we said, that's what we do. We play games up here and you're part of the game. <laughs> and, and you've got to veto this. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm just mad at you guys. And I'm just going to let it become law without my signature. <laughs> and that's what happened. Interesting. And uh, I don't think we've had anybody uh, killed uh, from the death penalty uh, or executed. From that. From that. Uh, since, and there was a murder that was down in my area, uh, mm -hmm. Gary Klepus, uh, uh, killed a girl, and that was in 93, I believe. And he's still alive and still uh, on death, sit on the death row. All taxpayer supported. And All, yeah, yeah, I'm sure they've spent at least 10 or 15 million dollars wow. on him uh, over the years, right. fighting and whatever. Wow. Yeah, and, and that is, you're right, nobody has uh, been executed since that was passed. And um, I, there's no telling where those laws will go here in the future. You'd mentioned um, back on the abortion issue in 92, and I, I was in the Senate w with you at that point in time and remembered your work on that. And what's interesting is um, that law that we all put together and you worked on uh, tr tremendously is still the law of the land today. Right. And there's been obviously a court case on another one, and then the, the legislature wanted to put that on a constitutional amendment, which just recently was voted down. Um, but. What's interesting is most people don't stop and think that that work you did in 92, and it was, it was truly a bipartisan effort to right. make all that work, oh, yes. which wouldn't happen in this chamber or maybe most chambers across the country today. Uh, and, and then with a governor that was, was willing to sign it. So it's, it's still the law of the land today and it works well. And I think it was truly some model legislation. Right, so, right. Um, that's great. After a time, then you decided to not run for the legislature again, as lots of people do. It's, it's uh, one of those things, and, and I think it's true. People should come here and serve for a while and then go on about their other right. business. It should not become a career. Now, having said that, I know we've had several long-time career service people, and that's obviously been their choice. So you're out of the legislature, um, back to Pittsburgh. Um, tell us kind of what you've... Well, I had rental property. I had uh, quite a bit of rental property uh, and did uh, appraisal work right. uh, uh, along with uh, uh, the time that I uh, devoted to uh, uh, working the, the yeah. rentals, <laughs> chasing people. Yeah. And, <laughs> primarily college right. uh, is what I college. had. I had about 30 it's units. And uh, uh, I, I enjoyed it myself, uh, uh, but uh, over time, uh, uh, I eventually sold off uh, everything, and uh, that's when I bought out uh, my uh, cousins and my sister on the, the farm. farm. Okay, yeah. that, that was a good trade of, oh, yeah, of yeah, properties. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah. I also understand that you are a, a very fine collector of uh, rugs and uh, some very fine antiques. All right, I've been uh, buying and selling oriental rugs for about 40 years now. And uh, uh, I, uh, well, I just sent off to Cedar Rapids at an auction house up there about eight, eight rugs. Uh, and I primarily, I don't, do retail, I primarily do it through auctions. Mm -hmm. And uh, have enjoyed it. Uh, I, I got started uh, in the 70s uh, when I met uh, Michael Grogan. Uh, Michael was the uh, head of the uh, rug department for Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. And I've maintained a relationship with him over the past 30 years. Awesome. And uh, uh, in fact, I just spent probably about $20,000 on rugs uh, in the last six months. All uh, through the auction? Yeah, all yeah. through the auction. And, and as an auctioneer, I think that's the great method of price discovery and you let everybody throughout the country 
right. um, uh, compete on those things. It's, it's, it, for, for what I'm into, it's worldly. Well, that would be true. Yeah. That would be true. And I know that you've helped me on some uh, rugs where you told me what to look for on the bottom side, which I would have never had a clue right. to look at that side of it. Um, your association here with a gentleman named I think Clyde Graber kind of got you into watches. Right, You're a big right. Watch collector. Clyde was a wonderful person. Uh, we uh, traded and bought and sold watches together. Uh, I probably, during the time that uh, I was up here, probably bought 20, 30 watches and sold them to various people that were out there and kept some of it myself, you know. It's like I told you that one uh, that I bought from, I gave him $3,000 for it, and uh, it was a rare watch, and uh, uh, they just sold one last year. Uh, they had an estimate of five to 6,000. I, I, I left a $6,000 bid, but the uh, watch brought $12,000. <laughs> you were just halfway there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, well, that's obviously been fun, and the relationships you develop here in the capital, your seatmate, uh, Rip, and the friends that you've made here, and our friendship that we met when we first right. got here and still continues today. Uh, those are some friendships that last forever. And I think the other thing you were saying uh, in one of our conversations is, and likewise, was so privileged to serve in an era where you could be friends with everybody here. Right. I mean, I got along with everybody in in the Senate. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the time that I was here. Uh, the last election that I had, I won by 9,000 votes. And everybody said, mm -hmm. you're going to be here as long as you want. I said, I'm leaving <laughs> this, at this the end it. of this term. This is it. <laughs> Somebody else is going to take my place. Uh -huh. I've got three kids at home. Uh, my wife needs me. And I've got a business at home right. that needs me. So uh, I left uh, and didn't run after 92. Okay. And left in 97. 97, okay. I, I was thinking that was mid-90s, so that, that would be about yep. right. So, well, it's, it's one of these, this government is truly, a, it's an honor to serve in government and to bring your expertise that you brought, especially with tax issues uh, that were at the time of the reappraisal and classification. I would, I would hate to think where we would have probably been without your knowledge and expertise um, at that time. Well, reappraisal and classification were probably the biggest issues that I had to deal with. Uh, and uh, as I said, I, I wasn't on the tax committee. Uh, when until they, it got to here. Until it got to here. <laughs> and once it got to here... Then, you were chairman. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had a lot of objections to both. Uh, the reappraisal, uh, I knew what I wanted I would never get. Uh, what I wanted was the state to take over the reappraisal system and each one of the county appraisers would have been a state employee and it would have been funded. Uh, neither the state nor the counties wanted that. Right. <laughs> so that, that just went, fell by the wayside. <laughs> and the classification amendment, like I said, what I wanted was an amendment that didn't have any numbers in it and the legislature could deal with the numbers every year. Mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't like that because they didn't trust the legislature. Imagine that. And, and <laughs> I, for all the, the problems, trust the legislature. Still to this mm -hmm. day, I, I, I really uh, believe that uh, the legislature will do the right thing. Right, and I think that's the governing process throughout state legislatures throughout the country as well as the nation. There's always things that we don't like, but at the end of the day, I, I concur with you. And I remember Mike Hayden, um, governor at that point in time, used to be in the House, um, said there's a couple of things you really don't ever want to watch being made. One of them's sausage and one of them's laws. Right. And uh, I think that probably still holds true today. Federal and state affairs, uh, Ed Riley was chairman and I enjoyed that committee. Uh, we dealt with uh, all the controversial issues, liquor by the drink, lottery, uh, 
I voted for all that stuff. That's right. I, I don't drink and, <laughs> and, and I don't, don't play the lottery. Ticket. But that was another item that was coming through the legislature at the time you were here. The oh, and, and, and like I told you, uh, uh, in the lottery, uh, before we passed it, Minden Mines, Missouri, which is just uh, about 50 people, was one of the largest lottery dealers in the state because everybody from Kansas was coming over to, to Missouri. Missouri to buy lottery tickets. They wouldn't buy anything else when they were there, would they? No. <laughs> A little bit of booze oh, okay. and, <laughs> and cigarettes, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, my district, 80% uh, of them probably, 90% wanted uh, liquor by the drink and lottery. Right. And, and they got it. Yeah, and as, I think there's only just a couple of dry counties left in the state today. That's um, probably very, right. Very, very few. Um, you know, and you talked about federal and state affairs and the lottery, and, and I remember all that discussion um, at that time, and there was a gentleman by the name of Reverend Taylor. Yes. Uh, who lived out here east of town um, and came and, and, of course, was against all those items, but was, and was his own self-funded lobbyist. He wasn't you know, funded by anybody else. Um, and I'm sure you remember him coming to your committee a time or two. Absolutely. I remember him just as, as clear as the day as he was back then. I can remember him sitting in that Fed State Affairs Committee. And, uh, uh, of course, he was opposed to liquor by the drink and opposed to lottery. Right. And uh, where he probably liked me was I was opposed to abortion mm -hmm. and uh, the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, those were uh, issues that he spoke to, uh, along with the, uh, the other issues uh, he was solidly against. Right. And I think I remember some of his discussion was that if you need to raise money for the state, just do a tenth of a cent of the sales tax will raise the same amount of money that lottery. Right. And that might have been true at that time. I'm sure it's not true today. But... Well... Uh, at the time, uh, lottery was so interesting to the people. Uh, they wanted it. I mean, uh, obviously, because uh, when you're sending over $5,000 to mend and mines to buy lottery tickets. At one little store. At one little <laughs> store. <laughs> and then they'd bring it back to... Pittsburgh and give it to everybody. Give yeah, give everybody. everybody a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing. Anything else in kind of closing you want to share about your legislative experience? And well, I enjoyed the legislature. I, I loved it while I was here. And uh, to me, uh, the Senate was like a big fraternity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you got along uh, with a lot of people. I mean, it was, it was an enjoyable experience for me. And uh, uh, I, I look back at it and I have no regrets. That's awesome. That's awesome. And the friendships you make and being able to get along and the legislative process, which today is very divided, which it wasn't then. You, you disagreed about issues. But at the end of the day, you were still friends. That's right. So. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, reappraisal and classification were difficult uh, to work through. Uh, but uh, the people that uh, uh, wanted uh, those, they never said anything against me as personally. As, personally, right, right. They might have opposed me. Uh, on the floor, but as far as uh, getting along, uh, you know, we could leave this chamber and uh, go eat a meal. Let's close on that. Um, there's a little place down here on Kansas called The Catch. Yeah. That uh, uh, was just great food. Tell us about, and there's lots of places in Waterloo well, and Topeka, but. Fidel, I forget his last name, Abdominian or something like that. Uh, uh, he, he owned the catch, and I started going down there uh, to eat fish. I'd eat walleye uh -huh. every day. Yeah. <laughs> and people started asking me, they said, we'd kind of like to go down there 
uh, but we're a little leery of it. And I said, you don't need to be worried about it. Come on down with me. So I started taking people down, and they liked it. And Steiniger and, and uh, Ed Riley, uh, they discovered he had a little rental uh, they could have parties at. Uh -huh. And they started uh, renting <laughs> from him. And when I left, Fidel said, boy, I hate to see you leave. <laughs> <laughs> you probably kept his winter uh, uh, business alive. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. And that was just one of the great little places to eat here in yeah. town as well as the others. And a lot of those things have changed today. Well, Phil, thank you for taking time to do this today and uh, share with us. And as we come to a conclusion on this one, again, this is done by the Kansas Humanities as part of the Kansas Oral History Project. And we hope that in the future, <clears throat> people will take, a, take time to listen to this and understand that government has worked and it can work. Thank you very much. Have a great day.